You're listening to Witch Wednesdays, your weekly podcast source for all things witchcraft in the modern world. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and I have a fun interview episode here today. On the podcast last week, we talked about various uh, divination techniques. There's a whole lot of them out there. So I have someone today that sort of specializes in that area, among various other things. So I am going to let him introduce himself and let you know all of the places that you can find him on the internet. Hello, thanks for having me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My name is Calum Turner. Uh, My business is Fortune by Calum. It's primarily a fortune telling, or I guess you could say divination uh, business. You know, that's the word that you're kind of using. And there's a lot of kind of hot debate around, is it divination, is it fortune telling? Um, But I do palmistry. Uh, also known as palm reading, tarot cards, uh, astrology, and a few other things. Uh, But I think I'm best known for palmistry or palm reading because it is a little bit of a a niche these days. Not a whole lot of people uh, do it, certainly in where I am. I'm in in Scotland and Edinburgh, uh, and I could probably count on one hand the amount of palm readers we have in the the country. (laughs) I think it's getting a lot more popular in the States. Um, and I have, but, I've actually never met anyone who reads palms. You're my first. Really? Oh, yeah. oh well, now you have, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of growing in popularity, I think, in the States, but I think it's just not as accessible as maybe tarot card reading. Uh, you know, that's how I got started. I've been a tarot reader for a long time. Um, you know, it's maybe harder to, to grasp or understand. Uh, it's a little bit more mysterious. Um, so I think that's maybe why why it hasn't kind of blown up in the same way that tarot has. But I mean, it's been around for thousands of years. I mean, you can date it. It predates the Christian religion uh, and the uh, the Muslim religion, Islam combined, you know, by at least over a thousand years, even when you put them together. So um, it really is an ancient practice. And it's wow. it's so great. Even in today's world, you can get so much out of a palm reading. Um, and it's very different to tarot. I love tarot. Tarot is my first love. Um, but palmistry is very different. Um, and I would say it's fortune telling. You could say it's divination as well. Um, yeah. That Yeah, that is so interesting. I... I'm going to look for one around here, but in case I don't find one here in Chicago, you do offer readings over the internet, don't you? Yeah, I had to, you know, I never really planned on it because um, I kind of have this romanticized idea of readings, or I used to at least, you know, of doing readings in person and uh, really kind of connecting to people face to face. But then the pandemic happened, of course. All right. (laughs) Um, in a way, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of glad that it forced me to go online for a little bit because it really opens up a clientele all over the world, um, you know, and it's really fun to meet people who are, you know, not just locals or, or kind of in the UK or just passing through, but really kind of going worldwide with it. Um, but I do, it is a little bit different giving a palm reading uh, online rather than in person, um, but you're certainly not missing anything. I actually think that you get a little bit more out of the online reading because, you know, I can kind of spend time with the pictures. Um, these days, I don't really go about kind of touching people's hands or getting too close for obvious reasons. But, you know, when I when I get pictures of people's hands, you can really kind of zoom in and spend some time with it. I normally do it by email because it's quite long. Um, you know, we can do like video chat sessions with it as well. But I think with palmistry, you know, it can really cover different periods in your life. It can cover childhood. It can cover elderly life and any period in between. So it's great to have a copy um, written down so you can really look back on what's been said and kind of how that's manifested throughout the years because people aren't always going to remember <laughs> a prediction well, right. that you give them, you know, for when you're 50 or 60 or 70 if they're, you know, only in their 20s. Um, but if you have that to refer back to, it's it's really great. And I often send it with like diagrams of people's hands as well, because I want people to understand their own hands and um, see where I'm kind of getting the information. And it can be quite powerful um, seeing things manifested in, in the lines of your hand or the shape of your hand, whatever it is. Oh, I really love that because I always emphasize on this podcast of really understanding why you're doing something. You know, we all use that right now we're in, as we're recording this, it's in February, but when it is played, it will be in March, but in February, you know, it's all about love. And so you use rose quartz and rose petals, but I like people to understand why, why they're doing Mm. that. Like, what is that behind it? So I love that you include that with your reading. So people really understand where this information is coming from. 
Yeah, and I think even with, you know, the hands are so personal, um, you know, looking into it, you'll, you'll be able to look at it all the time yourself, but not a lot of people pay attention to their, the lines in their hands, I've noticed. And these lines can change, you know, they can get stronger. If we get stronger, they can get deeper, they can fade, they can break, you know, depending on our kind of life experiences. So understanding a little bit about the lines in the hand, and I shouldn't even just say the lines, because it's really the whole hand, you know, we even read the fingernails. Uh, in a palm reading. <laughs> which really? changed. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they change all the time. They're not so much the future. Uh, the fingernails more represent, you know, your, um, well, we say if you have white spots on your fingernails, it shows what you're concerned about. So if it's on your ring fingers, normally the marriage or uh, the middle fingers career kind of stuff like that. But um, yeah, you can tell by the condition of the nails, the condition of someone's nervous system. Oh, wow. Because the nails are an extension of the nervous system, just like the hair. If your hair starts falling out, um, you know, it's probably not a good sign um, in the same way as if your nails are in poor condition. So it's really, you know, it is a palm reading, but it's a hand reading. It's hand analysis. We look at absolutely everything in the hand from color uh, to texture, which I can't always read. But even the flexibility in the hand, you can kind of read. It all means something in terms of usually your character, you know, your personality uh, or your well-being. Um, I wouldn't say health because we're not health professionals, but certainly you can see different sensitivities in the hand. Uh, and then the lines become a little bit more predictive. The lines that we see in the hands, they're more fortune telling for career or travel or whatever, whatever a person can ask there, you know, we we all have different hands. Wow. So do you read the dominant hand or the non-dominant hand? Always both. Always both. Always because, both. Okay. It's yeah. Like learning new they, things this whole time. Yeah, they. I mean, there are some traditions that will only read the the left hand, or some traditions that will only read the dominant hand. Um, I think the general consensus in palmistry communities is that the hand that you write with, uh, your dominant hand, that is your hand of free will. You create with that hand, so you create your life with that hand. Um, the other hand, the passive hand, would be things that are a little bit more fated uh, or destiny. I think that's the general consensus, but I tend to think of it more like public and private. You know, the hand you write with is how other people see you, whereas the, the passive hand I see is more uh, personal to you. Um, but yeah, there are different opinions out there, but sometimes people's hands are identical. Sometimes they're completely different. So it's always good to kind of check and see where the differences are, if there are any. Wow. So let's go back then for a minute. Is How did you get started in all of this? Mm. I think for a lot of people, I, I think... Um, I always use the same example. Like there are kids in the world who wait all year for Christmas. And then there's the other ones who wait all year for Halloween and they are the minority. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was, you know, I was one of those kids as a young uh, child, I was really into sort of magical archetypes. And I think I was like eight years old when I like made my dad buy me like the witch's Bible. Like we were in a bookstore and he said, what book do you want? And I'm like this one. <laughs> and, he, um, and he bought that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, oh, he was- he was more agnostic. Um, he definitely believed in astrology because he was like the stereotypical Sagittarius. But I mean, he was uh, also a Mason. He was a member of the Scottish Rites of Freemasonry, our local lodge. So um, he was very open to it. And my mom's a very kind of superstitious person. I think I got my first tarot card reading when I was 10 years old. Um, oh. And uh in a Vardal wagon, you know, a kind of traditional Romani caravan. Um, and then as a teenager, I really picked up the tarot cards. So I started started with them as a teenager, you know, maybe not too seriously because I was a teenager doing other things. <laughs> um, probably in my early 20s, I really kind of committed to spirituality. Um, and my my auntie, who's going to be uh, 85 next week, she's my great auntie, she ended up giving me a deck of cards that belong to her grandmother. So they're super old. Um, and she kind of regaled me with tales of like, you know, tea leaves and palm reading at her grandmother's kitchen table. And I just thought, well, that one sounds interesting. Um, you know, she explained the lines kind of like in a simple manner. And I thought, you know, maybe it is simple. Maybe there's more to it. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole of palmistry because <laughs> um, there's so much to learn about it. Um, you know, I'm always thinking that people will think that palm readings are quick and simple and a little bit, um, you know, non-detailed, but really there's so much in the hands for, for most people. Um, you could talk for a long time about them. Um, 
and then when I was 25, I decided to, to make it a career. I'm going to be 28 uh, in March, so in a couple months' time. Uh, so we're coming up three years on the business, and it's the best job I've ever had. You know, I've had a lot of jobs, and this is the most interesting one for sure. Um, and it's spilled over into other things like astrology, palm reading, palmistry, and astrology are really sister traditions. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, that's really exciting to be able to turn something that you love into your business. That's always, you know, the ideal in life. I think that's always my advice to people. It sounded really unrealistic to people in the past, but, you know, I, I hate to keep talking about the pandemic, but I've noticed a lot of people just started chasing their dreams after that, you know, because they're, you're trying to like bring your fate into your own hands. And um, well, if I don't, if I don't do it now, then when, you know, it really kind of sped the process up for a lot of people of just taking a chance on, on doing what you like. Um, and for me, it's worked really well. Um, you know, I think a lot of tarot businesses do really well, but really the palmistry became a niche for me. It's so um, uncommon these days. You know, people take a really big interest. Yeah, because it really is so personal. I mean, it's, it's your hands. So, yeah. I mean, you can't yeah, get yeah. more personal reading than that. And, you know, people can have um, quite strong reactions from that you know if you're talking about something deeply personal and you explain uh you know that's why this line in your hand is broken or that's why you have this sign in your hand um that can really sort of trigger people and amaze people almost because you know it's one thing to um hear a, a reader whether it be a tarot reader or a fortune teller or whatever it is it's one thing to hear them say that but to actually say like here it is like in your hands as if they were like a little map of your life um, it can be stream, extremely validating, which can be, you know, uh, bring up some intense emotions, whether they be they be good or, or challenging, um, just depending on what what's in there. Wow. So would you say palmistry then, let's say tarot is very set, if you're, if you're going with the Rider Waite Smith deck, that sort of really set in its readings and, and its meanings. And on the other end, tea leaf reading is very, you know, open mm. to your own interpretation. So where would palmistry fall on that sort of scale? You know, it's, it's so interesting because there is a different tradition of uh, palm reading all over the world. There's Chinese palmistry, there's Indian palmistry. Uh, obviously the Roman Gypsies, they have their own kind of traditions around it. I kind of fall into the more scientific hand reading and astrological palmistry you know I can I can always see the natal chart manifest in a person's hand um so I kind of fall into the more analytical like this means what it means <laughs> but I do think that even even having that structure you know there's always going to be an intuitive element uh because people are different and you know it's one thing knowing what the sign or the line means but interpreting for that that for you know, a person in their specific background and, and their kind of experience in life, it might be very different uh, for someone in India, say, versus America, uh, where the cultures are very different. So the interpretation can be flexible. Um, and I think tarot should be flexible. You know, I get I get what you say about the kind of Rider Waite Smith tradition, um, but there are so many more. Um, and same with other cards, you know, I'm, I'm big into Lenormand reading. I love Lenormand reading, and I, that's really based on tea leaf symbols as well. Um, so I think it can be both. I don't have, think it has to be one or the other, but if, if I'm teaching it, then I definitely go for the more analytical, <laughs> the more this is what it means and here is the structure, kind of like astrology. Um, there are different traditions of astrology, but you know, it's seen as very sort of calculated. Um, yeah, I would say it's uh, more on that side. So do you think some people when they sit down with a tarot deck have a hard time reading for themselves in the beginning, um, you know, especially as they're learning, but they can read more easily for other people is reading your own palm something that comes naturally to people or is it going to take a long time to even look at your own hand and, and figure out what it says. Well, you know, there are people in this world who have like three lines in their hand, <laughs> then there are other people like me who have like 30 odd. Um, I think I was given so many lines in the hand so I could kind of learn from personal experience. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it will kind of vary from person to person. I think palmistry is one of the ones where you can't really kid yourself as much. Um, you know, with tarot, people love, I mean, and I mean, it's it's a case of like a picture's worth a thousand words. So they're like, which meaning do I choose? And 
um, can I be flexible with my kind of tarot reading, interpret it how I want to? But with palmistry, it's a little bit more defined. Um, and it's about kind of finding the right tradition that gives you accuracy for that. Um, but I would say, I would say it is a little bit more, um, not pigeonholed, but, um, you know, there's not as much wiggle room <laughs> with palmistry. <laughs> Although saying that, the lines in the hand do change. It tends to take years, but they do change. And your fingernails change all the time. So uh, I never want people to feel like victims of fate if there is something they don't like in their hand. The reason it's in their hand in the first place is for them to discover it um, and either change it or deal with it better or kind of sway things their way. Um, you know, your hands really reveal your potentials and what you're capable of in life. Um, and you can change that. Yeah, I love that because, you know, people always get upset when they get a rough tarot reading, especially for you know, something <laughs> like the year ahead. Um, and you get the power and five of swords and all kinds of things, but that really is showing you what could happen. But if you change your actions and the path that you're currently on, those cards could go away and you could get a much different reading. Like you really have control over that. Uh, so it's really interesting that you can change your actions in your life too, when it comes to palm reading. Yeah, I always say to people, people ask me sometimes, they're like, can I change it? Like, does that have to happen? Or can I change it? I'm like, the future is the only thing you can change. You can't change the past. That, that already happened. Um, but the future is the only thing you can really mold. Um, and a lot of what palmistry is, is understanding your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, you know, it covers a few different areas. So the more you kind of uh, know yourself from it uh, and your potentials, the more you can kind of manifest from it as well. Um, I, do, and I do think of palmistry as kind of like a, a blueprint, kind of like if you're building a house and the house is your life. Um, but things always change along the way, you know, <laughs> rarely do the houses ever get built without no changes to the, the blueprint or, or something along the way. Yeah, that's, I think that goes for, you know, witchcraft in general. I think that's why a lot of people are drawn to it is because there is so much, you know, self-empowerment involved in that, that you really can look inwards and get a lot of information about your personality and your life and be able to take the steps to change those things and know exactly how to take those steps and make those changes. Um, so I think that's why people, that's one of the reasons I'm drawn to it. Yeah, um, and especially, you know, palmistry can help you understand your own gifts, uh, your own spiritual gifts, kind of, and also the kind of the planetary energies that really manifest in your hand. We divide the palm into seven sections uh, and we name and characterize them from, uh, for the the inner planets or the the kind of ancient planets as we would call them the seven ones that are closest um so if you have a very big mount of jupiter you know it's gonna it's gonna mean something versus i mean for me it's mercury um and that always relates to your astrology in some way so if you're interested in kind of planetary magic astrology um you know or even just understanding what what your hands have to offer uh, magically then palmistry is is really great for that I'm really interested to know what mine say now. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to put you and send you my my photos. So if somebody yeah. wants to book one of your readings, how did they do that? Where do they go to find you? So uh, usually a lot of my business comes through Instagram or Facebook, and it's the same on either one. My business is Fortune by Kalem. Uh, my website is down right now because I wasn't happy with it. Um, but I'm always happy if people want to contact me through Instagram at Fortune by Kalem, or they can search Fortune by Kalem on Facebook. Uh, and the email address, again, it's the same, Fortune by Kalem at gmail.com. Um, I do in-person readings here in Edinburgh, uh, in the capital of Scotland, um, but I'm usually available for online readings as well. Um, you do need a camera, you know, if it's a palm reading. Of course. <laughs> camera reading, you don't really, but I do ask, and I always provide examples and instructions, but I do need a good few pictures of the hands. It's usually four pictures of each hand uh, from different angles, so eight pictures in total. And even better, you know, if people want to understand their astrology, they can send me their birth details and I'll tell them, you know, this is why you have uh, a bent middle finger. It's because you've got a lot of Capricorn in your chart or Saturn in a prominent place, kind of stuff like that. Um, so it adds an extra extra layer to understanding uh, not just your hands but also your astrology as well. Wow that is so much information in one reading. I mean how long did it take you to learn to put all of these things together? I mean you must you've been studying your whole life obviously. 
I actually only found palmistry, I think maybe back in 2015. Um, you know, I've been doing tarot for years before that, um, but that's when I kind of started taking taking an interest in palmistry. And, um, you know, I didn't start my business until uh, probably three years later. Um, you know, I was just kind of, kind of getting personal experience uh, before them. Um, but it's actually not too hard to learn. You know, I do sometimes offer palmistry courses. I'm coming to the end of one right now, uh, the second one that I've done. But I always think it's better, you know, from this course I'm learning, it is better to have kind of one-on-one -on -one students because a lot of people um, do find it hard to grasp and they have their own questions. And it's difficult to do when you've got a class of like 14 or, or 20 people. Um, but my course is only seven classes, you know, and they're an hour each. And I I do believe that you could become a professional palm reader uh, after that. So, um, you know, I always encourage people to kind of do their own studies, but I, that's the kind of system that I have devised um, to, to make it work and to learn palmistry quickly. But it's the same as anything else. You know, you can you can read as much about playing piano as you want, but you're never going to be a pianist unless you actually have a piano and like sit down and play it. <laughs> yeah, it's the same <laughs> with palmistry. You have to look at hands and you have to just go for it and really start reading them. Same with tarot. I would say it's the same with card readings, you know, just get into it. Don't worry about reading like 50 books on it or taking like three online courses or whatever it is. Just find out what works from you and the best way to learn is by learning from experience I mean the the most interesting parts of palmistry that I've found is stuff that I haven't seen in books I've just seen enough hands I've seen thousands of hands that I've noticed oh this person shares this with this person and they have uh you know this similar line in the hand um experience really matters I think that's so interesting so what is what is your you know the quick beginning of your birth chart your sun moon rising so I'm Pisces. I have a lot of Pisces. Pisces, Sun, uh, Stellium. I've got four <laughs> planets in Pisces. <laughs> um, I'm Gemini Moon and Capricorn uh, rising. Yeah. Oh, so a little bit of a, <laughs> a weird mix. You're um, kind of all over the place. That's fun. That's a fun mix. Yeah. I, do, I am very stereotypically Pisces, though. I mean, I have four planets in Pisces in the third house, and I have Neptune in the first uh, and Medheaven in the twelfth. So it's just, it's a lot of Piscean stuff. Um, mixed with a, a little bit of Capricorn and sort of Mercury, Mercury and energy as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot of fun in there. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't know that I have any Pisces in, in my chart. I'll have to check. Well, everybody has Pisces in their chart. Some, I mean, yeah, depends, somewhere. No, we're dominant. I think it's just one. Yeah. I think uh, uh, the, the most kind of popular form of Western astrology right now is Placidus. And that's the one where uh, all the houses are kind of different sizes and the signs kind of overlap in the houses. But I use the oldest form of astrology. Um, it's the whole sign house system where there's one sign to each house and all the houses are equal 30 degrees um, and they all just follow consecutively one after the other. And the reason that I actually chose that over Placidus is because of palmistry. Um, I can always, always see correlations between the dominant parts of a, a person's hand, um, which we name after the, the planets again, and their whole sign natal chart. Can't always do that with Placidus. Um, it's not always going to show up. But to me, that is pretty much scientific if I, if I can say you know this is why it's manifested in your hand like this it's from the influence of your natal horoscope um then that system is you know really kind of proven they kind of validate each other there um on a level that I can't explain <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah that's that's why I kind of chose that and I do find it a little bit more accurate uh in whole sign I think a lot of old school astrologers are annoyed because it's easier and they kind of devoted their life to Placidus and you know they just want to say you're taking the easy and simple route out but actually it's more accurate and for me it's backed up by palmistry as well so um, I always recommend that people look into their whole sign natal chart especially if they don't feel like they relate to their Placidus chart or they're struggling to understand it um, go whole sign. I'm definitely going to have to look into it and send you my chart and send you my hands and see um, what is reflected in there. I think that would be super interesting to see how it all sort of comes together. Cause I, you know, I know like different divination techniques, um, obviously not palmistry. I'm not familiar with that at all. Um, but I, 
have, I still am not great at like putting all of those things together. So, you know, and I know like what my birth chart says, but I don't, I'm not able to like put everything together like you are yet. <laughs> it's astrology is kind of a long process. And I do think that it looks a lot more complicated and intimidating than it actually is. Um, I think it's just about finding like the right kind of system for it. Um, and whole signs perfect for that. You know, once you kind of know what the, the zodiac signs mean, then you can just apply it to the houses, not so much as a, an energy or a personality, but like as a, a life experience. So Taurus rules the second house. Taurus loves money. That's why the second house is money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Libra is ruled by Venus. It's the seventh sign. That's why the seventh house is all about marriage and, and relationships, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so it's just about getting a, a kind of like base knowledge for the stuff and then seeing how that applies wider uh, in the chart. I'm definitely going to have to look into that and see what it says about me. I know um, like from going in order, I'm Scorpio sun, I know my first house in Sagittarius, so I think first house is in Sagittarius and I know 12th is in Scorpio. So I know they go in order from Sagittarius one, two, three, but I don't, I've never looked into what all of them mean for me. I it can be very, um, you know, validating as to who you are as a person, but it's also a little bit predictive. I, I think the planets and are a little bit more important in that regard, you know, seeing which planets fall into which houses and what that means, that, that becomes a little bit more like prediction for your life. Um, whereas the signs are a little bit more like reading energies in the different areas of life or the different houses. Um, and then there's other things, you know, like the, like Chiron, um, you know, I, I really relate that to kind of past life stuff like that. So there's a lot you can do with the natal chart. And I love when different, I mean, I, I really do believe that all forms of divination are connected. Um, palmistry and astrology really go hand in hand, but you can even kind of meld tarot and palm reading. You know, if you see a kind of sign in the hand and, um, you know, it's negative, <laughs> but you're not quite sure what it means, then you can ask the tarot cards, you know, what, it, what does that sign in the hand mean? Um, I like it when people kind of blend methods rather than just keeping them separate because they all have something to offer and they can kind of help each other in that regard if you use them in conjunction. Yeah, I I would, it's like a goal of mine is to be, get better at that. <laughs> just um, do a little more like study in that area of how to combine all of those. Because right now I like, I really keep them like separate, but I think that was like the easiest way for my brain to learn different things is to just do like one thing at a time. But I would really, would really like to start combining all of those. But I mean, there's just so many, it's hard to choose in witchcraft what you really want to, you know, study and learn about. There's just so many options and they're all fun. I think people do get overwhelmed with, you know, what's right for me? Should I be a tarot reader or an astrologer or, or whatever it is? Um, of course, for me, like, I didn't want to pick one. <laughs> I really didn't want to pick one. So I had to learn them all. But I definitely think I focused more on one at a time, just to kind of feel like, you know, I was giving absolute uh, sort of study or experience to that one area. And then when you're confident in that, you can you can look at something else and then see how the two are maybe connected. Um, but sometimes it is best to keep them separate as well. I mean, I read tarot cards. I also read Lenormand, which I just think is a fabulous method for uh, reading the future. But they're very different. Um, and it's not always great to kind of confuse the techniques that are between the two. Um, you know, I do think Lenormand is more set. There's like three Lenormand spreads, I think, <laughs> that are really oh, wow. <laughs> recognized. And that's what you do, you know, and most people just use the, the one, the grand to blow. But with tarot, there's unlimited, you know, and you can really take it wherever you want. There's a little bit more freedom there. Um, yeah, but there are there are similarities. I mean, there's sun moon star card in both uh but you you would interpret them maybe a little bit differently in each one. Oh wow I have like a whole list I think you know take notes when my interviewees are, are talking and I have like a whole list going of like things that I want to look up now and do more research <laughs> on. there's just so many interesting things and uh that's why I love being able to interview people on this podcast because there's just so much expertise out there and things that you know I am not familiar with. So it's great getting all these different opinions and finding more fun things that I want to study. So of course, with this pandemic going on, it, it has changed, you know, everyone's lives and businesses, but in a quote unquote, typical day, if you could design a typical day, what does that look like for you as far as incorporating your business and witchcraft and all of the different things that you do? Um, how do you incorporate magic into your day-to-day 
I've always been a little bit more, um, I guess you could <laughs> sound terrible to say, but like a little bit slapdash. <laughs> um, you know, the kind of stuff that I would do, it's more, um, I guess you could say like low folk magic, just kind of like day to day, almost like, I don't want to say superstitious, but like things that I would find uh, useful. Um, you know, I'm I'm not big into ceremony. I'm not big into ritual. I don't even have an altar um, because I think of that as very sort of religious and, you know, the kind of background that I come from, you know, it's more, um, it's more just practical, you know, it's more just like little things day to day. Um, of course, I work nearly every day, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing readings almost every day. Um, but in regards to magic, I never really turn too much to it unless I feel like it's needed. Um, and even then, I, I don't think you have to have, you know, a, a bunch of candles or a bunch of uh, ingredients, that kind of stuff. I think it's more just about directive and using what you have around the house. <laughs> um, maybe I'm just like a lazy Pisces with that. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a little bit more true to where I come from as well um you know because here we wouldn't we wouldn't have had all that you know back 100 years ago or 200 years ago um I think it's just a continuation of how it's been and I do think of ceremony and rituals and covens and you know whatever works for you is fine but to me that's all very grandioso and and modern and not necessary um you know I, I like to keep it simple I like that. I agree with that. I have a lot of um, beginners who ask like, what can I do every single day? Cause I don't feel like connected enough or enough of a witch if I'm not doing something every single day. And like, you don't have to doing a ritual every day is like, I can't even wrap my brain around that. I would be exhausted all of the time. That just Absolutely. requires like so much effort and energy. And I just, I appreciate people who are on the same page where it's just, it's not necessary to do every day. Yeah, and I mean, if you want to to do something every day, there are things that I do every day that are more for like health and well-being. And, you know, you can turn that into um, like a spiritual practice. You can turn breathing <laughs> to a spiritual practice. You can make your diet, uh, you know, and it, and kind of incorporate different things into your diet that you feel are kind of working on a, on a magical level. Um, so little things like that. But I, I don't, I've never been the type of person to be uh, devoted to one thing every day. I think that becomes very religious. Uh, and nothing wrong with that if you're into it, but I never have been. Um, you know, I've always been a little bit more like just make a cocktail of what kind of works from you from different practices. Um, and you you don't have to drink it every day. <laughs> I love that. So before we wrap up, if, if I know you've shared a lot of uh, information for beginners already, but if you have any other tips that you would offer a beginner, which of course, beginner to paganism in general, and beginner to fortune telling. Um, what is your one piece of advice that you would offer them? Find out what interests you uh, and just follow it. It really does not matter what other people are doing. Um, you know, find something that interests you and go with it for as long as it does interest you. Your feelings are probably your biggest indicator of what you should be into. Um, and people are rarely bad at what they're interested in. Do you know what I mean? Um, oh, yeah. So like I've, al I've always been interested in tarot ever since I was a child. Um, I don't think that you would be interested in these specific things, whether it's divination or herbalism or spellcrafting or whatever it is. Um, just go after what kind of interests you. And, you know, it's fine if you want to do kind of book reading. I always think of um, magic as being more intuitive. Um, you know, it really doesn't have to come from a book. You don't need someone else to tell you what to do. Follow your feelings. Um, I remember years ago, and this isn't like a big whimsical story, but I remember years ago, I had I was filling out this job application and it was taking so long and it was just like really stupid questions in the job application. I was getting like so angry writing in it, like the pen was pressing harder and harder into the paper. And I just thought at the end of it, I was like, this paper has such like a horrific energy because that was a horrific application. Um, <laughs> I need to like clear it in some way. So I just literally like poured salt all over it. You know, salt is like <laughs> just the number one easy go-to ingredient. Sure. Um, for anything magical I just poured salt all over it and kind of blew it off you know and that was just a clearing from it um and I ended up getting the job and then hating it which is probably 
<laughs> of course, that's how it works. <laughs> why the application was pissing me off so much. But, you know, it doesn't have to be anything more than that. You know, to cleanse something, you don't need to burn something and surround it with crystals and do it under the new moon and all this kind of stuff. You can literally just use anything and keep it simple. Um, just follow your feelings, you know. That is absolutely great advice for a beginner, because like we said, it, I, there's so much out there to learn about. I mean, I've been doing this for years and I already, I have a list just from this conversation of more things that I want to look up that I've never learned about before. Um, so it's, it's definitely easy to fall into that trap of wanting to learn everything. You go into a bookstore mm -hmm. and you want every single one, I get it. Um, but I think that's great advice is to just pick one thing that you're super interested in and follow it. Wherever that's is. good that's good advice from time to time and again just because you're interested in something you don't have to do it for the rest of your life um but it's good that while you've got the fire that you're interested in that you know that's where to kind of put your energy you're interested in it for a reason um and eventually if not right away um i do think it's quicker advice if you just follow what you're interested in that you'll find something that works for you and that will become you know a part of you and kind of like a part of your life um, but if it doesn't, you know, there are times when there are times when I put down tarot, like there have been times where I just don't look at tarot for personal use. And like, it just seems to fade out uh, professionally for a little bit. And I focus more on other things. And it doesn't mean that I've lost it or that I'm not interested in it anymore. It just means that that's not what I'm doing right, right at that time. Um, yeah, so just go with the flow. <laughs> Keep it easy. <laughs> that's very Pisces energy to put out there. <laughs> Go with the flow. You All have right. To. Well, I appreciate you being here. Do you want to remind everyone? Well, it's pretty easy to remember, <laughs> but do you want to remind everyone one more time of where they can find you online? Instagram, Facebook, Gmail, Fortune by Kalem. It's the same for for everything. Um, yeah, I, it's I, super I'm, easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keeping it easy yeah um but i always recommend reaching out on instagram or facebook um just because those are the two places that i'm really active um that's where i get sort of uh, a lot of online clientele and i will have all of those linked over at whichwednesdays.com so you can find them easier and as this oh, thank you goes up i will make sure that uh, i mentioned you on instagram so everybody can find you easily um and get their palms I feel the like so many people are gonna be like oh my gosh I need to know exactly right now what's happening I'll do the same. everybody's always looking for a good witchy podcast um yeah oh, great to have a week as well <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for being here I really appreciate your your time and your expertise thanks for having me and everyone else I will see you next week need even more Subscribe to Patreon and YouTube for exclusive bonus content. Order a themed witchcraft box every month through Witch Wednesdays on Etsy. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Witch Wednesdays Podcast. Find all these links and more at witchwednesdays.com.